In August of 2005, Lise and I flew down to Louisiana in order to help with the relief efforts for people who were affected by Hurricane Katrina. I think you remember Hurricane Katrina? If you remember correctly, Katrina was a category five hurricane that ravaged not only the city of New Orleans, but many other cities along the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. Terrible, terrible uh, tragedy. The flood damage, as many of you uh, saw on television at the time, was just incredible. It was just mind boggling, the images that came out of that particular time. Total destruction total destruction of entire parts of the, of the city. Thousands and thousands of people left homeless or without use of their homes for months. Uh, many hundreds, of course, who died as a result of the terrible flood as a consequence of the hurricane. They had a 20-foot surge that came across. Imagine 20 feet of water, a wall of water just washing across uh, your, your, your neighborhood, your city. Those who were there said that it was as if an atomic bomb had gone off. The destruction was, was so, so bad, just unbelievable. And as bad as it was, you know, these aerial shots, it's if you were actually there to see it. I mean, it was just, your mind couldn't take it in. Now, just north of New Orleans, there's a community called Mandeville. And there's a Church of Christ located there called the Tammany Oaks Church of Christ. And at that time it had about 200 members. So not a very, very large church, about 200 members. Although the area of Mandeville suffered a lot of damage from the storm, a lot of trees fallen and water damage, wind damage, by some miracle, the church building where the brethren met, the Tammany Oaks Church, the church building was not affected. A lot of trees down and you, know, you, you had to drive around the, you know, the debris in the roads, but the building itself was, was intact. The thing that's interesting about this story is that the Tammany Oaks members had just built a brand new building there and it was about to dedicate that building on the Sunday before the storm came. You know, so they were all looking forward, the invitations were out, they'd spent time you know, raising money, building this brand new building, and they had sent out invitations to everyone, surrounding congregations, so on, homecoming, you know, come, we're going to dedicate the new building, and then wham, the hurricane changed their plan. So the day after the storm, several members began organizing a relief effort and they transformed their brand new building into a warehouse. A warehouse for food and water and other supplies that were given out to people who had been affected by the storm. As the days went by, churches from all over the United States began to send food, money, cleaning supplies, medicine, clothing, all kinds of tools, all kinds of goods to this congregation in order to distribute it to the many people who had needs. Now you need to remember, the building was brand new, hadn't been used yet, and all the materials that came in from all over the United States, all that stuff was brand new too. This wasn't like you know, secondhand clothing. Everything was new that was being sent there. Well, the way that Lisa and I got involved is some of our friends who were members of this congregation asked Lisa and I if we would come and help out. So we flew down to New Orleans and then made our way to that congregation for 10 days to join other volunteers who came from all over to serve this congregation in its hour of need. When we got there, this is what we saw. Every single day, all day long, trucks filled with donated supplies 
arrived to be unloaded and stored in the auditorium. Now they had a big auditorium that would seat more than 200 people because they were anticipating growth, but they didn't go the pew route. What they did is they bought those interlocking chairs so that they could move the chairs out and do other activities. Well, after the storm, they moved all those chairs out of the way so that they had a large space. This is aside from all the classrooms and offices, but the biggest space, of course, was the auditorium. And each day, trucks would come and back up, beep, 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 18 wheelers and all kinds of trucks would back up to the front doors. And they had uh, forklift trucks Imagine in this brand new building, carpeted building, forklift trucks driving around and picking up pallets of stuff and whirling around and piling it up in the auditorium where it was almost to the ceiling with all kinds of supplies. There were over a hundred volunteers who worked every single day in that place uh, to classify and to pack and to distribute the goods in the daytime. At night they slept on the floor in between the boxes or in the classrooms. Some of the men built a makeshift shower area outside and there were several showers with you know, stalls. It was all outside, men, women. They had to rip down all kinds of things that they had outside in order to set up this, this shower stuff. In their fellowship hall, they set up a cafeteria because you had to feed 100 people every single day. So there were cafeteria workers and stoves were brought in, all kinds of things. And each day, hundreds of people from different parts of the city and the state would come for food, for medical attention, for water, for counseling, just a simple hug, just to sit there, because they had nowhere else to go, because the word got out that if you needed stuff, this congregation, Tammany Oaks Church, was a kind of distribution point. And it didn't matter if you were a member of the Church of Christ or an atheist, if you had a need, you, this is where you, among other places, this is where you came. Interesting, I saw them, they needed a communication center because there were so many people calling, so on and so forth, and I saw somebody with a saw, you know, just saw a hole in the wall. This brand new, just saw a hole in the wall and just knock everything down and set up a communications center with all phone lines plugged in and strung out all over the place. Every day, some of the volunteers were formed into gangs or crews, if you wish, and they went into the city and into the surrounding area with chainsaws and mops and brooms and buckets and trash bags in order to clean people's homes or to remove trees that had fallen on their homes or on their cars. And all of these supplies and all of these services were given away for free in the name of Jesus Christ and His church. Now the time that Lise and I were there, it is calculated, just the time that we were there in the 10 days, it was calculated that the church, that particular church, gave away over one million dollars in food and in equipment, all donated by Churches of Christ from the United States, even from Canada. <clears throat> Lise's task was to work with others, filling orders. They had built, again, they were building stuff, nailed straight into the floor, you know, right through the carpet. Let's just drill. At a long counter where people would go and they would put an order in. And what did they need? Well, we need clothes, we need food, we need this, we need that. We had generators, they were giving away generators so people could get power going. And part of Lisa's job was actually as an order picker. She would get the order, her and others, and she would go down, oh, blanket over here, she had a big basket, you need this, you need that, and bring it to that person, and so on and so forth. Because I had, and continue, as you know, to have a bad back, I couldn't lift stuff, not, not all day long anyways, so they put me at the door, 
and I processed people as they first came in. You know, I was kind of a greeter, if you wish, but I, I give them a clipboard, sat down, tried to figure out where they were at, what they needed. So this means that during our time there, I spoke to and interviewed, in my mind, about 500 families concerning the effect that this hurricane and the subsequent flood had on them and their present needs. And I want to tell you, you know, talk about life-changing experiences. I mean, I had already been a preacher for 20, nearly 30 years at the time, figured, man, I've seen it all, <laughs> seen it all. You can't tell me anything I don't know. You can't confess to me a sin that I've not heard 10 times before. There's nothing so awful in your life that I've not heard it from someone else before. So I thought, you know, man, I've, I've seen, been there, done that, or seen it. But I heard stories, oh my goodness. There was one guy, he drove up in a Cadillac, big, nice Cadillac, and he had a nice suit on. And he said to me, I, I'm coming for food. I'm a banker. I'm the vice president of a bank. The only problem is, my bank is not there anymore. And my house is not there anymore. They're just not there anymore. And the only thing that I have saved that didn't get washed away or blown away is my car. And the clothes that you see me with, these are the only, this is the only clothes that I have. I can't go to my bank to get any money to buy because my bank isn't there. And my money's not there. And my house isn't there. I mean, it's not just damaged, it's not there. And so I need, I need food. <laughs> I'm hungry. I'm sleeping in my car. I never thought I'd be a homeless person, me the vice president of the bank. We had people, six, seven children, no home, no nothing, zero, everything wiped out. So many people not only lost their homes, but they lost their jobs because the place they worked at wasn't there anymore. There's no job to go to because there's no garage, there's no factory, there's no office building, there's nothing. So I could just go on telling you story after story after story, but I think you get the point here. So this experience taught me some important things that I'd like to just share. You know, sharing night, this is not doctrine night, this is sharing night. A couple of things you know, from the flood, what Katrina taught me. Number one, Katrina taught me that ordinary people are very, very brave. They can be very brave. You know, we pay money to watch Hollywood actors pretend to be brave. But I witnessed true bravery in Louisiana. For example, I'll start with the church there. The Tammany Oaks Church of Christ lost half of their members in one day. We find it sad, you know, if we have a, a member, you know, a family, for example, very involved, she teaches, he teaches, or you know, maybe a deacon, maybe someone serving as an elder. We find it very sad you know, if we lose one of those families because, well, they just, he's got a new job in Tulsa, and, and they're, well, goodbye, it was great while you were here. You know, we hope we'll find somebody to kind of pick up the slack. You know. They lost half their members in a day. And remember now, these are the people that decided, we're going to build a new building. We're going to trust the Lord to provide. We're going to get into debt. We're going to build a new building. And the day before they inaugurate the new building, what happens? They lose half their members. Because those people lost their homes and they lost their jobs and they were transferred to other cities. And yet, here's the thing about bravery. And yet, the elders and the leaders of this congregation chose to organize a relief effort that would require twice 
their original members to succeed. So they lost half their members and they took on a project that would require 300 people to pull off. They trashed, and I mean they literally trashed their brand new building by converting it into a warehouse and a dormitory for 100 people. Brothers and sisters, this is faith in action. This is courage. This is bravery. Another example, the people who came in every day for help, I mean, I've never witnessed such bravery. People who had lost their jobs and their homes and everything in it in a single day managed to smile. They were patient while they waited in line. They were hopeful. They were still trusting that God was good and would help them. So many people, they wanted me to sit and just pray with them. They get their stuff and they say, before we leave, would you mind sitting with us and praying? Would you mind sitting with us and asking uh, and thanking God for His kindness? <laughs> How does a person do that? They lose their house and their job. They're homeless, they got no money. They're living at some relative's house you know, on dry land somewhere. And they're asking me to lead a prayer to give thanks to God. That's bravery. Not the fake bravery we see it in movies. This is bravery at the highest level because they had every reason to complain, every reason to be bitter, and yet they were not. So I learned that courage is demonstrated in ordinary people when they continue to do ordinary things while going through terrible suffering and loss. It's a very courageous thing for a woman, for example, to pick up her kids after school and do their homework and call their mother and look in on the neighbor who's not feeling well while she's dealing with the fact that her husband left her. See, that's courage. That's, that's bravery. Bravery is a brother in Christ who continues to uphold the highest standards for his own personal conduct, despite the fact that he may be suffering some illness or disease or some loss. That's courage, that's bravery. Another lesson that I learned. I learned about the great potential of women in ministry. I always knew it, but I saw it in action in New Orleans. One of the interesting things about this benevolence project is that it was mostly led and organized by the women in the church. Now the elders had gotten together and made the decision, I would, you know, they got a call, would you, could we, your, your building's the only one standing, can we use it for warehousing and you know, would you take on this responsibility? And they, these men, these courageous men, they stepped out in faith. It would have been easy to say, look, we just, we got a brand new building, you know, we're in debt, you know, we, we can't just trash the place. We need to be good stewards. <laughs> But they didn't, they didn't. They said, we'll, we'll do it. The Lord is calling us to do this work, we'll do it. So they blessed the effort to begin with, but it was a sister in the Lord, her name is Janet Hines. She was the one put in charge. Why? Because she was a woman? No. She was put in charge because she had experience in this type of uh, emergency crisis management, that's why. And also because many of the men of the congregation had lost their jobs and so on and so had been transferred out. They had to go find work to support their families. And so Janet had experience in organizing these types of things and she did, and she did a fantastic job. In addition to her, other women filled key positions 
in coordinating finances because they were receiving thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars were coming every day, checks, cash, money orders. This had to be accounted for. Well, we had women in that congregation who are bookkeepers and accountants and they stepped forward and said, well, we can do that. And we had volunteers who delivered things. We had several nurses, registered nurses, one who was a member and another one who just wanted to help and she came from out of town and she dropped everything and came and brought medical supplies and so these women provided the, you know, the first aid and the, you know, the medical, they were the medical people. Yes, were there men? Of course. There were men there doing all kinds of tasks. Who do you think were, were handling the chainsaws to cut down the trees and to you know, bulldoze stuff and so on and so forth? Both men and women on those crews, but the men, let's face it, they were doing the heavy lifting. But it was interesting that the way things worked out, it was the women that had the key roles. It was just one of those things. Now the wonderful thing that happened, however, was that when Sunday worship was organized, because every day we'd have a devotional, very early in the morning, I don't know, 7.30 or something, you know, all the workers would be there, we'd have a devotional, prayer requests, strategy meetings, the elders would talk about some of the goals we had for that day, so on and so forth. But then on Sunday, there was a worship service. And what they did is they just moved the boxes over and pushed things back and got some of those chairs and put the chairs up and so that everybody could sit. And the wonderful thing that happened is that when Sunday worship was organized, the men took the leadership of that public service, just like the Bible teaches. I observed a beautiful balance of shared responsibility with the sisters taking the lead in an important work of the church. Why? Because they had the expertise. And then the brothers taking the lead where the Bible directed them to do so. No back talk, no snarky remarks. Everybody understood they were fulfilling the roles that God had given them. What impact the church would have if we could unleash the power of women in ministry? We know that here, don't we? We know that here. We have a dynamic, dynamic women's ministry. Women who minister and women who minister to one another in this congregation. And you know who you are. As a matter of fact, I had lunch with a young couple today who were visiting. And uh, in wanting to know about the church, so, well, let me tell you about the congregation, you know, and uh, you know, I began to share with them, well, you know, we're well established, blah, 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 this and that. And one of the things, you know, we have this and that, and one of the things I said was, and we have an amazing women's ministry here, not duplicated in many other churches. So my experience in Louisiana taught me that it is possible to do this without creating conflict in the church and without compromising the teachings of the Bible. All that is needed is humility and submissiveness by both men and women so that we can all serve the Lord with our best gifts and not compromise the teaching of the Bible when it comes to the male spiritual leadership that God has given to the men in the congregation. I just saw that principle working so beautifully, so harmoniously at this time of crisis in New Orleans. And then the third lesson, there were more, but as you know, we, preachers are not allowed to give more than three of anything, so. Third thing that I learned, God's ways are really not man's way. I mean, really, you know, we say that sometimes, we give that lip, so, well, God's ways are not our, well, trust me, I, oh man, God's ways are absolutely not man's ways. The newspapers said that the churches were able to bring assistance to the victims four days ahead of the government services. Four days ahead. Now the United States is the most powerful and wealthy country in the history of mankind, yet a little church of a hundred people was able to organize itself and begin serving the disaster victims 
four days before the government managed to distribute a single blanket. Humans, you know, made speeches, we raise money, we send in the military, but God is the one that works in the hearts of people. You see, the government can't make you want to serve, but the Spirit can move one person to influence another to serve as He did with us through the emails pleading for our help written by both Janet and her husband, Doug. I mean, why we ended up in New Orleans doing what we did, you know, that, that's a God thing. And I didn't preach a single sermon, I didn't teach a single class, I didn't even lead a prayer. In times of crisis, God not only helps the victims, but He manages to mature the volunteers through their service. And no government can do that. And in times of chaos, God brings order. As we saw at the church where each day brought overwhelming problems that were resolved through His grace and the wisdom that He gives to those who serve Him in faith. In the end, I saw no wasted effort. Every little thing being done was contributing to the overall good of both the victims and the helpers. My experience taught me that God is present in all stages of His work and He helps us take every step of our journey in serving Him. Many times we think, you know, Lord, let me, help me just get through this crisis part. And we forget that it was God that brought us every step of the way until we got to the crisis, through the crisis, and past the crisis. Whatever makes us think that God stops being with us when the times are good. He's always, always with us. So all of these things happened you know, a long time ago. And of course, Lisa and I, you know, long ago, we've gone back to our routine and the comfort far removed from the chaos that was created by Hurricane Katrina long ago. But the lessons learned there will remain with me for a lifetime. I will not ever forget the potential for courage that resides in each of us and I will encourage that always in you. Because I see it in you. I see it when I visit you in hospitals, I see it when I uh, observe you serving others, I see it as you work through your issues in your marriages, in your relationships, in your being alone. I see it. I see brave men and women dealing with their stuff every single day. They don't make movies about that. They only make movies about make-believe heroes but there are heroes every single day doing courageous things because of their love for God and their faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. We should never forget the heroism that we see around us each day that is there to inspire us each day. I will never forget and continue to um, exploit, if you wish, the power that women have for ministry. And I will always encourage our sisters in Christ here to aspire to greater and greater works of service. It was never God's intention for your gender to limit your service to God. That's only in your own head. And I will always remember and hope always to remember that God's ways are so far above our ways. I will always, always seek His way first and hopefully always seek His way in all things. So the Tammany Oaks congregation is still there. It's a small church. It'd be nice if I could say, well, you know, after everything they just grew to be, but now there are 2,000 people. No. No, 
they never quite recovered from that terrible blow because of where they are, people moved away, it took years to rebuild, you know, they're still there, small church, with all the scars of Katrina still there. But in its heart resides the memory of its moment of testing and the satisfying assurance of one who has been a good and faithful servant because their moment of testing came and they passed with flying colors. So I pray that we can learn the lessons of the flood taught by Katrina, and I hope that as a church and as individuals, we, we have, and we will respond faithfully when our time comes or when our test comes. So if you need the prayers of the church for you, for your needs, or the witness of the church for your baptism, if you need encouragement to be strong, to be courageous, to be brave, to be submissive, to be ready, in any way that the prayers of the church can help you, we encourage you to come and ask for it now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.